and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Craig. And I'm Todd. And this week we are taking on a request. This is a recent request from uh, our listener, Paul. Uh, and he texted us to commend us on our Rosemary's Baby episode, I believe. And he said, by the way, if you want to see the most messed up movie I've ever seen, you should check this out. And and his review was, it sucks, but I think it would be fun for you to talk about and <laughs> <It's a> glowing <laughs> which you know can't wait to jump into a movie like that <laughs> no sometimes movies suck and they're really fun to talk about because that, they suck. that's true yeah yeah um but honestly i went okay so uh, <laughs> you may have heard this backstory before and i'm not going to get too much into it because i don't want to divulge all my secrets publicly but um i'm a school teacher um but i only teach seniors in high school where i live and where i work seniors get out of school a week before all of the other students so that teachers will have the opportunity to get their grading done um in time for graduation which happens right after everybody else leaves this year, as has happened some previous years, I was able to get all my grading and, and, and stuff done a little bit early, so I had some free time. And so I was just kind of searching around um, free streaming services that weren't blocked by my school server, and Tubi was one of those. And I came across this title, and I remembered that Paul had recommended it, and so I thought, you know, why not? I'll give it a shot. And I watched it. And I was intrigued. Um, it's it's not the type of movie that I would have ever expected to like. And I don't know if I would go so far as to say I liked it. But I disagreed with Paul. I did find it disturbing. I did think that it was pretty messed up in a lot of ways. But I didn't think it sucked. And the whole time that I was watching it, I just kept thinking i am desperate to know what todd would think of this movie because <laughs> uh, it's it's different it's out of my wheelhouse it's a little bit i mean we've done some weird you know darker types of films like may and the woman and I'm sure others that I'm forgetting, but it's not necessarily our standard fare. Nonetheless, I did think that it was very interesting, and I did want to talk about it. Um, so that that really is my history with it. It came out in 2017. I had never even heard of it, and it was kind of a little bit of a challenge to find much information about it. Yeah. Um, if uh, you dig deep enough into Google, you can find some interesting reviews and some interesting commentary. I don't really know a whole lot about the production because there's just not a lot out there to be found, um, but I did think that it would be an interesting movie to talk about. So um, what are your thoughts? Huh. Well, <laughs> I have a few thoughts right out the gate. <laughs> um, okay. First of all, who's watching Oliver? I guess we have to, we don't shy away from doing difficult movies. Pretty much anything is on the table for us in this podcast. And so, you know, the, the world of horror is a pretty wide open book and it ranges from the silly and stupid to the really dark to the really thoughtful to the plain out just um, exploitative uh, that sometimes just I think for you and me both just really pisses us off yeah uh, in a lot of times you know we we are not big fans of sexual violence no nope. um, we're not big fans of gratuitous violence we don't huh, it, it's probably hard for people to believe right especially people who aren't horror fans but I think most of our listeners are horror fans and so they get it they get the difference between you know, watching somebody get cut up, uh, watching somebody get slashed in like a Friday the 13th kind of movie, and then a movie, say, like Hostel, which is a little more realistic and a little more brutal and a little more like, oh, this could actually happen, and it's extremely unsettling. Then there are the movies like just about serial killers and murderers, and God knows this are, this exists in our world, so... Mm -hmm. 
it's a different kind of it's it's not as escapist <laughs> it's not the escapist fantasy that you get with uh just some supernatural you know person who's terrorizing people or a ghost story or something like that this is definitely far far in that letter camp so this movie has a lot of sexual violence in it it's very disturbing i thought of it as a cross between maniac yeah and mother's day i kind of felt like those are two movies that are very grindhousey. Um, they came out much, much earlier than this in the late seventies, I believe. For each of those, Maniac was redone fairly recently, I think, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as a big budget movie with um, what's his name from Lord of the Rings, right? Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood, and it was done in a slightly different style too. I think it was done kind of first person, kind of interesting. Yeah. But, but that movie was following a serial killer throughout his day. It was a character study, really, and yes, I found it cool i I mean the movie's brutal for its time anyway and uh it's a little it's pretty disturbing as well but there's something about it it's a character study and you kind of are intrigued by this man what makes him tick and what's going on and why is he doing the things he's doing it's not that there are any big reveals it's just a character study of a really disturbed person who kills people that is like what this movie is too and then mother's day was a movie that we thought we were going to hate because we knew it had a reputation for having some really disturbing rape scenes in it. Uh-huh. And and that movie was about some guys who torture and kill women for their mother's entertainment. Right. But we watched it and we thought, hey, you know what? Actually, A, it wasn't as bad as we thought it as its reputation had. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, women are get the, the subject is disturbing. You say it out loud. And of course, it's it's terrible. But the actual way it was filmed wasn't as brutal and as disturbing as some of the stuff we've seen. So at least we were spared that. But this movie, um, it doesn't spare that. It is just shy of pornography, really. And it's very unsettling that way. And it's in your face. And I guess, you know, when we when you talk about how, what he said about it and what you disagree, you know, about the movie sucking, I guess we have to define what suck is, right? <laughs> what is suck? I mean, did the story suck? Did the idea suck? Did the acting suck? Was it poorly made? And I would tell you, the acting was pretty good. Uh, yeah, I liked it. Yeah, the mother's acting, uh, but maybe that's really just what they were going for. But I'll set her aside and say that the rest of the acting in the movie was very good. And then I'll say the movie was extremely well made, as in the cinematography was good, uh, the shots were interesting, the transitions, the lighting, uh, there, were, there were definitely major artistic choices being made as far as the tone of the color schemes of the movie. Like, it seemed like when he was happy uh, and things were kind of going well, the movie was a little more colorful. And then, you know, when bad things were happening or he was in his dark place, the movie got very gray and almost black and white. What I did manage to find about the movie is the director, Richie Moore, is mostly a, has been a camera operator for some decent sized, right. big budget Hollywood movies. Yeah. And it seems like he might have ended up in Thai, in Thailand and is still there um, because a lot of the movies, more recent movies in his oeuvre, including this one, take place in Thailand. And it seems like uh, the main actor in this film was traveling to Thailand and got involved in some movie productions down there. He was a stand-in for Bradley Cooper when they filmed part of one of the Hangover, movie, hangover movies down there. Uh-huh. And then, according to his biography on IMDb, just decided to stick around and got involved with, it seems like, maybe a little circle of filmmakers doing these movies. I'm just bouncing back and forth. And, and this actor is in a couple of this other director's movies. This director's written a movie that the main actress is in also, and they all kind of take place in Thailand. The other actress in this movie, um, Sarah Malakul Lane, who played Sophia, she's the other one of the three main characters, and she's half Thai, half Irish, and has been involved in apparently a number of, of productions there. Well, and she's been in some other big things. I think she was in It Follows, and I don't remember. There was another movie uh, yeah, on her um, resume that I recognized. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a roundabout way of getting to my point. Um, I did not enjoy watching this movie. At the end of the day, I when I say did I like it, no. I, I, don't, I didn't like watching the movie. It turned my stomach. By the end of it, I felt like kind of what's the point, especially when the end credit scene came up. Uh, the scene after the end credits, and then that really capped it for me. Like, I thought, okay, this is, 
this is trying to be artistic, and it is an artistic character study that's well acted, but I didn't get anything out of it. I felt like it was putting me through some really uncomfortable paces with no payoff. And especially with the end credit scene, I felt like, oh, okay, so it's just... (laughs) <laughs> it diminished the film in my eyes even more. I'm, we'll we'll talk about that later. But uh, I, did the movie suck? I mean, that's really hard to say. Some people might enjoy this. Some people might get something out of it. Some people might have liked it. I didn't find it a pleasant viewing experience. I'm going to have a really hard time finding things to say about it. And I just want to say, sometimes you can piss me off too, Craig. (laughs) (laughs) Back at you, brother. (laughs) You remember this the next time I make you watch a Giallo movie (laughs) or some, you know, Italian zombie film that I did watch this movie at your suggestion. <laughs> All right, well, here's the you thing. Didn't know. Like you didn't Fair said, enough. You didn't know anything about it but going in. So. But I, I did, though, because I watched it. Oh, yeah. And then I wanted to talk to you about it. That's and true. it's because I was, I was surprised. And you said a lot, and there are so many things that I want to respond to. One of them is that I do think that the cinematography – is really good. Yes. Like exceptionally good. This guy who is, you know, who has done, you know, first unit camera work on a ton of stuff. He's current, you know, he's he's working for Marvel right now. Hmm. He's uh shooting Miss Marvel. He's good. And it does feel a little artsy, but it feels like a different it's shot like a different type of movie. And I think that that adds to the overall feel of it. Like it feels less like a horror movie in most parts mm. and more like um something like an Ethan Hawke like before sunset mm. kind of movie like you know people walking around in foreign places with you know like you said the light and the saturation and um and everything kind of comes from It's not first person. Like, we're not seeing things through Oliver's eyes, but it's all from his perspective, basically. And it does get dark, and and there is, uh, it it is graphic and graphically violent. But I have said over and over again that I am averse to sexual violence. It really makes me uncomfortable. I don't like it at all. And I don't, and I don't like it here. But the more that I thought about this movie, and then watching it a second time, it is really not that graphic compared to a lot of the things that we have seen. Mm. So Oliver is this nerdy guy, you know, in, in the beginning, you don't know what's going on. He's just this nerdy kind of odd guy who seems to be just kind of aimlessly wandering around in Thailand. It appears that he's either just moved there or maybe he's just on vacation there. And he has a very specific routine every morning and he, you know, he wears these big nerdy glasses and he wears nerdy clothes, you know, uh, short sleeve collared shirts with ties all in very muted, dull tans and browns well, and yellows he's, he's almost like an artifact out of time he he dresses like a 1940s middle-aged businessman like doesn't he wear suspenders and he has these ties and maybe he slicks his hair back with like old-fashioned like brile cream type stuff it's really yeah yeah grease like he greases his hair back yeah it's weird yeah and he's weird now i hesitate to get into this because i am not a medical professional but i feel like they were going be, because it, it it is also becomes apparent that he is medicated we find out later that if he does not take his medications his mental stability slips badly i think that he's meant to perhaps be on the autism spectrum oh, or absolutely. Something like that. Again, please don't come at me. I'm not a doctor. I do work with people with various mental health issues, but I am certainly not a professional. But based on my experience and my observation, I would say probably 
on the autism spectrum. And and that's important to the story because he's so meticulous about everything. The first time we meet his mother, his mother only exists on a computer screen. Um, he Skypes with her, basically, every day, every single day at the same time, which appears to be late for him, but maybe they're in different time zones. I don't know. It's like 1 a.m. for him. I did the calculation. It's 1 p.m. for him, right? Or oh, is it? I don't know. Well, depending on where, I assume she's living somewhere either in, in, in the U.S. or Britain. Yeah. Could be anywhere between uh, 11 a.m. and like 9 a.m. probably, something like that. And she's this boozy i don't know <laughs> late late betty davis <laughs> yeah betty davis type right that's that's a good description and she's brassy in kind of an off-putting mean way she's really mean. she's really mean but the first time you meet her hello oliver how are you how was your trip hi mama i'm fine it's very hot here mama's very happy to know you're safe and how are the girls there? Have you met anyone yet? No, not yet, Mama. How about the house? Is everything set up? Do we have everything we need? Yes, Mama, everything's fine. Don't worry. Good, because it's time. And remember, darling, next time, dress code. Sorry, Mama. Sorry, Mama. Well, I don't want to keep you. Have a nice time. Thank you. Be safe. Talk to you later. Bye, Mama. That's in the morning. And then his alarm goes off at 10 a.m. and he wakes up in the morning. And there's this just fun, jazzy score Mm. as he gets ready for the day. And the score for the movie throughout is so antithetical to the content of the movie that it's just jarring. Like, it's... You're like, what am I watching? It's peppy, jazzy, big band type stuff, which which, which also, see, this is the mystery that I was hoping maybe you could help me solve, is that he is, he's not old enough to be stuck in an era that he grew up in. He wasn't born in the 40s or whatever. We're talking modern times because he's, he's Skyping with his, with his mother. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is his mother's era, but it's, it's not just his clothes and the way that he does his hair in his glasses, it's also like his apartment. Like his apartment has these old fashioned picture frames in it and he has an old style uh, desk with a desk lamp and everything. For a moment I thought I was in a period piece until I remembered that he's Skyping with his mom. And then he goes out in the street and you realize, you know, it's modern day. No, it's modern, yeah, it's day. modern day, modern day Thailand. So I, I'm, I can only think that maybe mom, this is sort of her era. I, I mean, I think every time he dials in with her, she's got this kind of music playing in the background, right? Uh-huh. So I think that's what it is. I think that he is so influenced. You know, everything in his life is the influence of his mother and or his mother and his father, which comes in later. Mm. But it, it's like... That's what he was brought up with, and he hasn't been able to break away from that, which (laughs) fits with everything else, too. Okay, so after he gets himself all ready, he goes out walking. He sneaks, I believe, into an amusement park. Mm. Oh, through the tunnel, you think? That's what that was? Yeah, like through a train tunnel. Yeah, it it doesn't seem to be a public entrance, and this is – it's an amusement park. Now, I've never been to Thailand, so I don't know if it works the same way as it works in the United States, but in the United States, you pay a whole bunch of money for admission. But he's just hanging out there, um, and he's got his camera, and he's taking some pictures. He's very awkward, very awkward, but I've worked with young people – who are awkward in the way that he is. Uh, It's not so bizarre, you know? He's just an awkward guy. But then at night, he goes to this seedy club, and he very, very nervously, like, he has to talk himself into it, and, like, out loud, and how he's going to do it, picks up this girl who's obviously strung out, and so he lures her home back to his apartment with a promise of drugs when he gets her there he gives her drugs it seems to be cocaine because she snorts it i don't know my understanding of hard drugs is very limited (laughs) but but she's sitting there cutting her drugs on a photograph a framed photograph of his mother behind her he takes off all of his clothes except for his boxer shorts which are 
you know, something that a 70-year-old man would wear. Yeah. And I also noticed, I don't think I noticed it right away uh, the first time, but this time I did. He he has something, scars on his upper back. Mm-hmm. And, and nothing is made of it, but I did notice this time. And while this girl is taking drugs, he sets up the video chat. He says, Mama wants to watch. And the mother, aside from just being an old bitch, is just nasty. And she talks super, super nasty to this girl who... Uh, if that was cocaine, I guess it was cut with something or something because she is virtually incapacitated. While Mama watches and gives instructions, Oliver rapes and tortures this woman. And I wrote down the things that she says while this is happening, but they're so vulgar that I... I I can't even bring myself to say them. (laughs) I mean, it's just the most nasty, misogynistic, horrible things that she says and that she tells Oliver to do to her, which he does. And ultimately, he grabs a giant knife. The mother objects like, no, 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 not yet. But he slits the girl's throat. And the mom's kind of upset that he killed her so quickly, but she says something like, well, at least she's still twitching. At least I get to watch her twitch. And then she says, just so in such a cavalier way, well, it was short, but fun. Could have been better. Now clean up and go to bed. Sweet dreams. Mama loves you. And then she closes out. Mm. And after she closes out, Oliver, the girl's dead, but... He apologizes to her and he keeps saying and, – and, and he's obviously visibly upset, like on the verge of tears. He says to her, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't hate you. I don't hate you. I did it really fast, a lot quicker than she wanted me to do it. And then he ends up hacking her up very, in a very meticulous fashion. Everything's very clean and orderly. Um, and he takes her body parts and dissolves them in some kind of chemical in a – big industrial tub in the alley which is kind of stupid yeah. realistically but whatever now the the point that i've been trying to get to all along is that is very gratuitous and violent but you said in the beginning there's lots of sexual violence there's not that's it no now there's one other one is there yeah i mean there's violence but i don't remember there being another rape I mean... It's implied. Well, I guess it, it cuts away just before it happens. You're right. Because because I, I talked to my partner about this, and I said, I don't like that. I don't like sexual violence. And here in this first scene, it is violent. It is gratuitous. There's no question what's happening. It's not as gratuitous as some of the sexual violence that we've seen, but it's very bloody. It's very violent. But I feel like they... The director, the filmmaker, chose to make that scene so violent and so gratuitous so that he wouldn't have to do it again. Mm. From that point on, you understand what's happening. You don't need to explicitly see it. Now, yes, there's still a lot of carnage and blood throughout the rest of the movie but mostly what you're seeing throughout the rest of the movie is aftermath and yes there are a lot of naked ladies covered in blood with various uh injuries you do see a lot of that but you don't see that explicit sexual violence again and maybe it was seeing it a second time and kind of having that in my mind that made me realize yeah it it doesn't really happen so much again i guess um so. and i mean you're right personally i kind of appreciate that i appreciate the establishment this is the horror that you are dealing with but i'm not going to make you watch it again you just understand that that is what is happening now and and what it comes down to is he's doing this repeatedly but he's doing it at the behest of his mother and 
really, he doesn't want to be doing it. But he is so under her thumb that he can't break away from it. And beyond that violence and that gore, it's really just a very sad story of a man who is a product of horrible abuse who is unable to break free of his abuser. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> uh, I mean, I get you. There is one other scene, and you're right. You, we don't see the rape happen, but we do have a woman tied up in a similar position. She's conscious and screaming, and the mother is saying nasty things about her again and is saying, I want to see her asshole and flip her around so I can see it, which she does. And she's like, oh, that's so tight. You know, she's never been, uh, you know, yeah, never had yeah, it done there. And yeah. so this is going to be really fun. Now turn her around. I mean, uh, okay, you know, it cuts away before he does the deed, which, you know, is a little bit better than before. But heck, the the, the, the buildup to it was even worse. I mean, it, it's it's very degrading, very debasing, very horrifying stuff. <laughs> But it's, and she, but as degrading and debasing as it is to these women, and, and these women are certainly objectified by the mother, and one could argue by the filmmaker. I, I think mean, so. all of, I think all of these women are very large busted, and, you know, he's in Thailand, so yeah. <laughs> it would make sense that these women would be of that persuasion but you could also argue that it's very sort of asian fetishism kind of stuff going on here too um it's also implied that most of them are prostitutes true which i which i think oliver justifies his own actions in that way in, in fact the first girl when he's apologizing to her after she's already dead he says if i hadn't done it meaning killing her the drugs would have done it only slower so slower so i i think that he tries to justify it to himself but it's not only degrading and debasing to the women but it's so degrading to oliver too right. like she just says the most horrible insulting degrading things to him all the time in these moments and there's another important part is eventually he meets a girl <laughs> in the amusement park that he hangs out with and 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 that's important and I want to talk about it but when he finally confesses to his mother well he doesn't even confess at first but she kind of picks up that something's going on and I think um that she suspects that he may be seeing somebody and so on one of their video chats, she forces him to jerk off for her. And it's like, show mama how much you love her. But then, I mean, it's just, it's so gross. Like, it's yeah. so disgusting. Um, and it's, you know, he's crying and he doesn't want to do it. And he's saying he doesn't want to. And, and he's tried. He's rehearsed in the mirror how he's going to tell her. Mama, I don't want to do this anymore. You, you, you know what I mean, the killing. It's not who I am, it's who you are. I'm, I'm sorry, but, but I don't want to do this anymore. You, you, you can't tell me what to do. I'm not, I'm not a little boy anymore. I'm a man. I met someone. I like her, and she likes me. This, this, this has to stop. I, I still love you, but, but I won't do this anymore. It's wrong, what you make me do. I have a cat, and a girlfriend. She, she might even love me. Why? She can, she could. She could, I could be like everyone else. I could, I could be like everyone else. No, no, no. I don't have to listen to your bad words anymore, mama. 
No. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye, Mama. But in front of her, he just has absolutely no power at all. Um, and as much as he's rehearsed it, as soon as she starts making demands, he does what she demands. And it's – first of all, I mean it's just the whole notion of – a mother forcing her son to jerk off like a cam girl, you know, it, 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 it's gross. Well, but you and, feel bad for him. Like, well, and isn't that's weird. Like, I, I think that that's something that makes the movie interesting to me. I think that we are supposed to feel bad for Oliver and, sure. and, and almost maybe be rooting for him in some way. Well, he's a pathetic character. Yeah, you're right. We are supposed to be rooting for him. I mean, he's, you know, all the tap dancing that we did around what what might be his actual affliction, he's clearly mentally unwell. I mean, it's not just that his mom controls him, but her, his mom probably controls him because he is mentally unwell. He's got some mental issues that have to be controlled by medication. And his mom uses that because she's a nasty person to just make him do things. I thought mom was, here's the thing, like, okay, you can say that this movie is really trying to paint a more sympathetic portrait, and it is, of Oliver. It's a portrait of a person who's a a product of abuse and, um, you know, this happens in the world. And so the knowledge of this, we, we can be more sensitive towards it and things like that. I mean, I can get on board with a movie like that, again, this kind of character study, but it's offset by the mother character is just so unbelievable. I mean, she's so over the top. And I don't just mean the nasty things she's saying, but her delivery and her heavy makeup and sitting in front of that thing. I I mean, every time she comes on the camera, it's like a a very poised, posed... um, well, it's the same scene, but it, it, it looks like uh, it doesn't look like just somebody logging it from their webcam. It, she's in front of a wall with pictures on it. And she's sitting there. She sometimes has a drink in her hand, often has a drink in her hand. Mm-hmm. I felt that the mother character was so over the top that it stopped being an interesting, realistic character study of a person in this horrible, in, insane, extravagant situation to being a kind of dumb, exploitive horror movie. I mean, that, that killed the, that feeling for me. And you're right. The, the, we don't have to see a lot of the sexual violence over and over again. But we're seeing it in different forms. We're seeing the aftermath. We're seeing the dead bodies. The, the camera leers a lot over these bodies of women. And, they're, and, and it's not just like, hey, we're trying to show you how horrible death is and, and, and make it realistic. But it's like over their curves and their, yeah. their legs. And it, sometimes it, you, you know, it, it, this full frontal female nudity in here. Yes. You can say, yes, these women have been debased. And so it's showing that. But where is the line where the filmmaker themselves is kind of debasing these women as well? And I felt like it just crept a little too much into that territory for my liking. You know, it's a line. There's a line there. And uh, I guess maybe it's a little different for all of us what we're willing to tolerate. But my interpretation of the film was that at that point where the mom character was just so extreme and over the top, it reminded me a lot more of a 70s exploitive grindhouse movie than what the movie was purporting to be otherwise. Which, like you said, and you've got you have a very good description of it. It's very artistic personal it's very in your face with this guy and you are supposed to feel sympathy for him but i just couldn't in those circumstances because it didn't feel like the filmmaker was all in on giving us a sensitive portrayal of him when the mother character is just this way i don't disagree that she's over the top she is i bought it um i don't know if it was the actress or something about the performance Or I think that maybe it was the way that she and Oliver interacted because she was so domineering and he was so submissive. He's a broken person and she, I think, played a big part in breaking him and I think that he is just helpless in front of her. And I think that she wields that power 
maniacally. She enjoys it. She enjoys the power that she has over him. And she relishes in it. And and so I kind of bought it. The other thing is, <laughs> she's a monster. And that's how we're supposed to view her as a monster. One of my favorite parts of the movie, and I think that other people would argue that it's cliched and stupid, I totally disagree. There's one part this cat just shows up at his apartment and at first he tries to shoo it away but eventually he embraces it and it's kind of nice like he kind of has a relationship with something other than his mother um and there's just this one brief scene where he's sitting on the floor surrounded by these drawings that look like illustrations out of a children's book and he's talking to the cat and he says this is my story and you can see the title page and it's called raised by monsters and he tells the story he says little oliver was happy and brave but he was raised by monsters he didn't want to be a monster one day daddy monster hurt Oliver burned him, but yeah. m- burned him right, which explains the scars on his back. But Mama Monster saved him and killed Daddy, and they lived happily ever after. And then he pauses for a second, and then he just very quietly says, "No, they didn't." And that's the end. Like this kid, clearly, you know, both of his parents apparently were horrible and horribly abusive and he has these scars apparently from his father burning him and then you know just the mere fact that his mother murdered his father and he knows about this and i buy her as a monster uh and so her over-the-top performance doesn't bother me in fact i think it adds something to the movie you compared it to Mother's Day, which I hadn't even really considered, but it is like that. Yes, in a way, the the mother in Mother's Day is very over the top. But, I mean, that movie is very over the top. Yeah. you could almost call that movie a very black comedy. It is, um, and that's what made that work in that circumstance is that we never took Mother's Day that seriously, right? Because the mother mm-hmm. was so over the top, and and that performance was was that it was the right performance for that movie, and that is what tampered down the sexual violence because you couldn't really take it that seriously and so you're right it became a black comedy this movie was listed on i watched on amazon prime and it was listed there as a horror comedy oh and i said that i god no i mean there is a little bit of dark humor in here but you cannot classify this as a comedy no and um and, and imdb doesn't classify it as a comedy so i don't i don't know what's going on over there at amazon but uh i mean the other thing that i that that just didn't it didn't land for me either, was the introduction of the love interest. He's sitting in... In fact, it happened in such an odd way that I thought maybe there was going to be a twist coming up. He's sitting in the park on his bench like he normally does. It's part of his routine. It's just to go and sit. He has a camera with him, but he never seems to actually use it. And he just sits there on the bench and is looking at things, and suddenly a woman in a dress, very Hollywood-like, kind of creeps around behind and seems to take interest in him from behind then kind of sweeps around the front and kind of sits down and strikes up a conversation with him. This very unlikely (laughs) conversation with this random stranger who's not saying or doing anything, who's completely awkward, who can't even halfway talk to her, but she seems struck by him. And at first I thought, this must be like a figment of his imagination. This is Uh like his other id or something chatting with him. And that's what's going on here. I mean, I guess it still could be. (laughs) I don't know. I don't think the movie's really arguing that, but it could be one interpretation. Oh, it's possible. You never see her interact with anybody else, really. It's very true. But but the the introduction of her, I mean, she just sits down next to him. Now, first of all, she's a beautiful woman. Yeah. And, And she's dressed, you know... I don't know. I'm, I'm not a fashion kind of guy, but she's dressed really cute, very put together. I mean, she does not look like the kind of girl who would be approaching weird guys on park benches. Now, to be fair, he plays the role so very awkwardly. But like you said, he was a stand in for Bradley Cooper, you know, in some movie or whatever. If he were to. <laughs> 
present himself in his natural way, I can only imagine that he's actually a very handsome man. Yeah. Um, but he just plays the awkward so crazy. She sits down to him, and the first thing she says is, I had the craziest dream last night. Mm -hmm. And um, she tells the whole story of this dream, and I think that it's – I didn't think anything of it the first time around. It sounds a lot like his story, doesn't it? Right. She's like – Okay, so I was on this ship. It was like a cruise ship, but it wasn't really that fancy, so maybe it wasn't a cruise ship. But everybody was dressed really fancy, and I was dressed in rags. The only way I knew how to get off the ship was to jump overboard, so I did. Anyway, I was in the water, and I was so happy. And then the craziest thing happened. My my tooth fell out. It's really strange. And then... I saw a piano at the bottom of the ocean playing the most beautiful music. I just, I felt like what, in in a nutshell, what the story is, is that she was very out of place somewhere and had to escape. Mm-hmm. And yes, that's very similar to his situation. And according to her, now, they just had, I mean, it's very much a meet cute. He's very awkward at first, but... He keeps coming back every day, and she keeps coming back every day, and and it blossoms into what is obviously a very innocent romance. They do cute stuff together. They ride the paddle boats together, and they go on the amusement park rides together, and he does use his camera to take pictures of her and to take pictures of them together in silly, cute, couple kind of situations. I mean, he, he's always awkward. That never goes away. But there's clearly a shift where he seems to be opening up and having an actual fun and making a connection with somebody. Mm-hmm. Over the course of that time, she, I think she tells him before she finds out what's going on. Um, but she says that um, she comes from a place where... She just says she didn't have a normal upbringing. She didn't go to school. She didn't have friends. And he says, were you in a cult? And she says, yes, but I didn't know it. And he says something like, well, what was it like? And and she says something like, they made children do things that children should never have to do. It's It's all very vague. Yeah. Eventually, he is conflicted, I think, because he wants to be with her, but he's still – the mother is an anchor for him. Like he, she's the albatross around his neck that he can't get rid of. And he tells his mom that he's met somebody and he thinks that he can be happy. And she, it's just prime – manipulation from this mom oh you met somebody oh you think she loves you well if she loves you she must know everything about you right she must know about all those poor innocent girls that you beat and tortured and raped and killed all those poor sweet girls like you know nobody can ever love you nobody uh, mama loves you mama protects you you know mama's the only one who will always be here for you and then she tells him go get this girl uh and bring her to me and he says he will now I think knowing that he was going to be confronting his mother, he was very nervous. So he had cut that day short with Sophia. Sophia, being curious, had followed him and has continued to follow him. And so she sees when he comes back out of his apartment, goes back to that same seedy bar, picks up another girl and brings her back and tells the mother, this is her, this is the girlfriend. But, gosh, I'm sorry, I'm... I'm, getting long-winded but i keep thinking of things also apparently in this instance whether it be because he's nervous or what he's forgotten to take his medication yeah and so when he gets back with this girl he loses it and he's very violent with her 
But the mom can tell that he's not taking his medication, so she's trying to calm him down. And it's very strange. She sings a song to him. I looked it up. It's a German song. It's a song that's meant to be sung when you're bouncing a baby on your knee. It's a song about a a guy riding a horse, and he falls off, and he hits his head or something. I, I doubt there's any real significance, but it's very repetitive, and she sings it over and over and over again, and eventually he starts singing it with her, and she starts substituting the words for the song with, Oliver, take your pills, and he finally does. So she thinks that he's killed the girlfriend, because that's who he said this girl was. Um, but as it turns out, he goes to the park the next day, and Sophia says, I had another dream last night, but it was a nightmare. I dreamed that you had another girl. And he says, no, no, I don't have another girl. And she says, I know, because I saw you dump the body. And I was very taken aback by that the first time I saw the movie and it is weird Mm -hmm. because she's just okay with it because in her mind they're both broken he does things she even says he he's like i i don't want to do these things i don't want to do it but my mama makes me there there is another woman in my life it's my mother and she makes me do these things and she says i understand that's what childhood is all about being forced to do things that you don't want to do Mm. so obviously she comes from an abusive background as well so they have this kinship and this understanding of with one another where she's willing to accept that he does these things because she gets it yeah i don't know it's weird It, it doesn't make any sense to a logical mind right you know But maybe if you are such a broken person, you could empathize with another person who's broken in that way. Sure. And it's sad. It's sad for both of them. And, like, it makes you root for them. You want them to to be there for each other. You want them to rescue each other. Yeah. It's so weird. It's so weird to be rooting for these broken sad characters i i agree with you i just i just it just wasn't convincing enough for me Um, the the relationship was just really rushed and the meeting was very sudden and she just instantly starts talking about stuff that he can suddenly relate to like what did she just see something in his eyes or something from the back of his head and 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 she's so not okay so she's beautiful it's not a big deal right okay so she's beautiful that's fine but she's too pretty, she's too accepting, she's too... I mean, there's no conflict there. We're, there's no personality there. We don't see her struggle with this at all. We're just supposed to accept, well, because she told a couple stories about how broken she is now, we, we're going to have to understand that she also must come from a broken home, and that's why she is willing to accept this and forgive it. It was much better or easier for her to, be, to believe that he you know, could kill these women rather than, you know, that he had another woman or could cheat on her. I mean, it all makes sense when you try to argue it out. I just felt like the way it played on the screen wasn't convincing enough for me. When they do establish this connection, he does confront his mother, finally. And and, and he seems happy. He seems like a different person. Was he? Did he stop taking one of his pills at the same time? It seemed like he was only taking the yellow so. pills. He was taking uh, pills, but only one of them. I don't know. It was a small detail. I wondered if it was significant. But he does tell his mother, I've met this girl. I'm in love with her. And she's like, what are you talking about? I thought we killed her. Um, but he says, I'm not doing this anymore. I can't do it. And he closes his computer screen. And there's like... <laughs> just a very brief montage where you see that he's joyful like you know he's laying mm-hmm. in his bed playing with the cat he's smiling and laughing <laughs> but coincidentally and simultaneously he goes back to the park the next day and Sophia doesn't show up yep and he keeps going back seemingly day after day 
looking for her and she doesn't show up and it 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 destroys him and eventually and not unexpectedly when he hits rock bottom because she's abandoned him he goes back to mama yep. and he talks to her and says she left me and the mom's like of course she left you you know nobody loves you but mama and he it goes right back to routine in fact it seems like he starts killing on a more frequent basis and and it's right back to it like steps right back into this the role that he was initially in the exact same routine um but yes then and we see this is where it's very gratuitous with the nudity i mean we just see naked woman after naked woman getting hacked up or laying in pools of blood or whatever but eventually he's uh just killed this one woman and mama's still on the screen watching this but he is hacking up this woman and Sophia shows up and she walks in and he kind of looks up and she looks down at him and he's just happy to see her I think <laughs> but but you know it doesn't quite register on the face cause but he's, right but but where were you <laughs> yeah. you know yeah like, what happened yeah and she her excuse is just it's very vague but it's like it's almost like people were coming for her and they couldn't let her out. I wondered if the whole her family, her family, her, her, she she's yeah, she said that her family found her and and kept her and wouldn't let her leave. They kept her captive, I guess, and she's only now been able to get away. I thought maybe it was they were implying like a mental hospital or something like that. I don't know. And that could be, but she does say it was her family. Okay, okay. Um so you know, the mother kind of comes on and she starts taunting him and anti antagonizing him. And they both go to the computer and close it on mom. Then they're both undressed and there's a dead body on the floor between them, all bloody and gross. And they have this kind of awkward bit of walking towards each other, slowly approaching each other. Basically, this is the consummation of this relationship over a dead body in the middle of the room, mm. which none of them care about, neither of them care about, right? In fact, they're, yeah. y- 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 there's a big to-do made of it where they're stepping on the floor and it's sticky and they're kind of st- finding the right way to st- stand over the body. And they kiss and they embrace. Then that's the end, right? The credits, the credits the roll. The credits roll. Uh-huh. And the credits roll, and they're pretty short credits, actually. Um, not a lot of people worked on this movie Right. Uh, and then uh, there's an end credit scene. It's it's the same shot of morning again with the clock. And Sophie uh, is in bed and she kind of wakes up and she looks down and he is back on the line with mother. And she looks a little alarmed and he turns around with a knife and lunges at her. And then it goes black. Well, and and it shows the mother on the screen with like demon eyes oh yeah she's and, and like, that's and that's not like i don't mean like rosemary's baby demon eyes just like like black like her eyes are just black and she says something i think in a different language but i couldn't tell but in a very uh, demon voice that yeah, we've never heard before. heard before she has a very kind of high grading voice really um and i thought that that was a weird and interesting choice to suggest perhaps something demonic or supernatural at the end because there had been no suggestion of that before. Yeah. I actually, you know, I I liked the end credit scene because it was fun and tonally it was it, it kept things really dark. I kind of think that if you end with the 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 scene that comes before the credits roll, that seems almost more in keeping with the trajectory of the movie it, it's yeah. almost as disgusting as it is as disgusting it is it is for them to be consummating their relationship over this mutilated body it feels like the happy ending yes you know they they have each other and they've shut mama out and it, it feels like the happy ending the the end cap takes that away from you yeah and, and that's okay uh, that, that, i mean that's it's fine uh, it, i don't know if it's a choice that i would have made but whatever no the end credit for me just kind of confirmed 
I felt like, okay, this movie all along was just ex- exploitative. Uh, uh, again, really well made, but like, what is he now? Freddy Krueger? You know, like, ah, you know, you thought everything was fine, but now, you know, it's, I'm never going to be free. And mom is turning into some monster. And now ah, I'm going to get you too. Like, it just... I mean, you can argue, well, it's going to take a lot for this guy to break free of the grip of his mother. Right. But wasn't the whole point of that last scene, like, that this woman could be his salvation? They closed the computer together. I mean, I thought that was significant and purposeful. And then you throw this thing at the end, and it's like a, ha ha, gotcha, kind of back to friday the 13th ish type horror movie i thought it did the movie a huge disservice and it just kind of capped my feelings like i said before that if they were going for a character study but they also had too many elements in there that that made it unrealistic and just like an exploitative horror movie and that was off-putting to me and it made all of the stuff that i think was supposed to shock me with a purpose feel like it just shocked me to shock me yeah, the supernatural element of that that very very last scene, I could certainly do without. However, I do think that the movie or the filmmakers, however you want to phrase it, were intentionally nihilistic. Like, no, you don't get a happy ending. People don't just miraculously escape their demons, for lack of a better right. way of saying it. As much as you wanted to believe that Oliver could break free from his mother, no, not he's happen. not going to. Yeah. No, and 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 I'm okay uh, with that. It, overall, I just I don't know. I was surprised by this movie. It was very different. I thought that it was skillfully made. Like you said, this guy has a lot of uh, camera experience, but this is his only full length. Um, film that he's directed and I think shows a lot of promise. I, I also the guy who played Oliver his name's Russell uh, excuse me Russell Jeffrey Banks um, he co-wrote the script and, and he plays Oliver and I thought his performance was really really strong. It was it was very very, strong. very nuanced, very believable not exploitative you know when you have people playing individuals with mental health issues or disabilities you walk a very fine line because it can fall into exploitation and and that's not good but i didn't feel like i I thought this was very well played and no you know i watched it that one time kind of casually like i wasn't you know i put it on just to have something on i was doing other things but i found myself being pulled into it watching it the second time and watching it closely i really appreciated what was going on i'll never watch it again there's no reason to watch it again but for people who you know are interested in interesting filmmaking interesting storytelling i think it's a i don't think it sucks <laughs> <laughs> i think i can get on board with that too <laughs> all right we appreciate the recommendation um from paul thank you paul you know it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea but uh, it's definitely something that is interesting and that i was uh excited to talk about so thank you for that um if you enjoyed this episode well first of all if you have anything to share with us about this because we were you know i read several reviews it did pretty well critically for the most part the critics liked it mm. the critics that didn't like it hated it yeah. but a lot lot of critics really liked it but other than that i wasn't really able to find out a lot about it if, if you've got any insight into this movie that you'd like to share with us please leave a comment uh, either on our web page or uh, on our facebook page if you liked this episode of course you can find us wherever you can find uh, podcasts streaming just google search two guys in a chainsaw podcast our web page our facebook page everything will pop up for you you can find us there until next time i'm craig and i'm todd with two guys in a chainsaw